I'd now like to turn to Dr. William Wilson, who's a chief economist for the Institute for Research of Developing Markets, mm -hmm. recently returned from China. And I'm going to ask you, uh, William, perhaps to comment on the relative position of Russia vis-a-vis -vis the famous other three BRIC countries or other developing markets that you might wish to talk about. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. I just moved here from uh, China, and I must say uh, it's very nice to be here in Moscow. Uh, <laughs> very, a, a very pleasant change. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks uh, today, uh, and briefly, we're running out of time, on just two countries. Uh, I'm going to focus, even though our institute is focused on all the emerging markets, just not the BRIC countries, I'm going to focus on India and China uh, for a few minutes because I think they're going to be competing uh, with Russia over the, next decade, over the next decade, mostly in terms of attracting uh, global capital. Um, I believe one of the most important stories going on right now is that uh, China is gradually, if not quickly, losing its favored uh, destination status for foreign direct investment. And the, I think there are a large number of factors driving that right now. Uh, right now you have uh, wages in the great global uh, uh, eastern seaboard cities uh, rising by 15 to 20 percent a year. And they've been rising by 20 percent a year now for quite, uh, uh, quite, some, quite some time. Uh, this year the Chinese economy will grow at its slowest pace in 22 years. In short, the era of real GDP growth in China of 9 to 10 percent, it's over. It's over. You're not, you're, you're not going to see it again. The Chinese stock market, which right, right now is still the second largest in the world by market capitalization, is largely dominated by state-owned companies. Uh, the return on equity capital has not been good. Uh, the Shanghai Composite Index is at 2,000. In 2007, it, it was at 6,000. China's grown by 10% a year the last 20 years. If you invested in the Shanghai Composite Index 20 years ago, the annualized rate of return was 2%. 10% growth, 2% return on invested equity. We'd have done much better in Russia, particularly since uh, the year 2000. Um, while all emerging markets suffer from a lack of transparency, obviously, the lack of transparency with uh, Chinese companies is, to be frank, absolutely shocking. Uh, there is very little correlation between reported cash flow and net income. In our research, we found that when cash flow is high with Chinese companies, they report lower income to avoid taxes. But when cash flow was low, they actually report higher income to avoid getting audited. That's the worst nightmare for a Chinese company, uh, to get audited. Only one Chinese company has been listed in the U.S. during the first half of 2012. To top that off, the complete lack of Chinese soft power is now beginning to hurt its investment climate. The Chinese have declared the entire South China Sea as their very own. Never have the Americans been so popular in the Pacific. In response to the uh, violent anti-Japanese uh, uh, riots in China last month and this month, the Japanese have slashed auto production in China by 50 percent. And they're reevaluating future investments in China as we speak. Now that said, China's attractiveness to foreign companies in, in some respects, to be frank, has never been better. At $8 trillion, no emerging market has the scale of China. When a Western multinational enters China, they are often forced to share proprietary uh, technology they would normally not share with other emerging markets. This is helping China move up the value chain, extracting proprietary technology, because they're enormous scale. At the end of the day, they are so big now, if you're a multinational, you have to be in China, with the except possible exception of Google. And despite the rapid rise in Chinese labor costs, many of its industries remain very competitive. Labor costs are much lower in the interior provinces, and both manufacturing and economic growth has been shifting to the interior away from the coastal region. The Chinese auto sector now has a vast domestic supply chain. It's got 
some first world infrastructure, the ports in China are fantastic. And a, a doubling in auto wages is not going to cause the Chinese auto industry to shift abroad anytime soon. So China's goal in terms of attracting the, uh, China's goal right now is to attract the right kind of foreign uh, direct investment uh, as it tries to rebalance its economy away from exports towards consumption. And most importantly, as, as China's obsession is moving up that value chain. A few, words, uh, a few words about India, current investment climate. Over the summer, we were reminded that India has many drawbacks by the world's largest power failure, a blackout that affected, by the way, 600 million people. India grew almost 9% over a seven-year stretch and, like Brazil, started feeling really cocky. But that confidence of a, uh, a few years ago has quickly dissipated. The political system seems paralyzed, and the economic reform process stalled about five, six years ago. In India, you still need government approval to lay off employees with firms, more than 100 employees. That law alone essentially discourages large-scale enterprises from entering the country. So if you've done business in India, you know there are a lot of negatives. But as an economist, um, the fact is, I like crises. Uh, my mentor told me many years ago, uh, cheer up, Bill, things are getting worse. Because they, because they often lead to structural improvements which pay dividends way down the line. For example, just in September, in last month, the Indian government uh, uh, very quietly, didn't make, make much news, offered uh, some significant reforms. Uh, they will now allow 51% foreign direct investment in multi-brand retail. That's quite significant. 30% of, of Indian produce rots before it reach the, uh, reach, reaches the market. They're allowing 49% investment in foreign airlines in the aviation sector for the first time. All this announced in the last 30 days. And liberalized FDI rules for the broadcasting sector. The fact remains this, foreign multinationals remain interested in India for, for the long play. According to uh, Ernst & Young, 60% currently there actually plan to expand, not leave. India's FDI in 2011 was $60 billion. That's quite respectable compared to uh, China's $100 billion. That $60 billion is a many multiple what India was getting just about five, six years ago. Of course, the big difference between China and India right now is the rate of urbanization. China is now 50% urbanized. In the greatest migration in human history, 400 million people in the last uh, uh, 15 years have moved into the cities. India is only 30% urbanized. So India will require enormous capital, enormous foreign direct investment over the next 10, 15 years as it uh, urbanizes. Okay, one last point on India that I really like about India. Unlike in China, capital is largely allocated by the private sector. <coughs> India's largest companies are private, not publicly owned. And despite all the bad news about India this past year, and it's, and it's been a bad year for India, uh, its stock market, would you believe it, its stock market is up 25% year to date, making it one of the top performers in the world. If Andrew, if I have two more minutes, sure. I want to talk about that. Uh, two more. I want to talk about this, the the commodity markets. Um, uh, the last decade was a breakout decade for almost the entire emerging world, and one of the major reasons why was one of the greatest bull markets in American history for almost all commodities that we saw over about a 10-year period. I can't think of a single factor more important in impacting the investment outlook in all the emerging markets, including Russia, of course, uh, than commodity prices. The bad news is this. I think there are at least three reasons why I expect commodity prices to continue dropping, maybe quite violently, over the next uh, three to five years. First, last decade, commodity producers were caught off guard by the surge in demand. The surge in Chinese demand, in particular, at the beginning of the last decade, was awesome and unprecedented. Since there is a long lead time between intention and supply, 
For the next several years, we will continue experiencing rapid growth in most commodities, the output of most commodities. Second, almost all the increase in demand the past 20 years, most of the last 10 years, can be explained by the incredibly unbalanced growth in China. As China rebalances its economy towards a more consumer-oriented economy, fewer exports, less fixed investment, um, its growth will be a lot more capital uh, uh, intensive, and, 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 and its demand for commodities. Lastly, surging Chinese uh, hard commodity purchases in the past few years supplied not only growing domestic needs, but also inventory levels. The result is that inventory levels of many basic commodities in China are much too high to support uh, that growth over the next few years. In fact, there's talk of China being net exporters of some very basic commodities, iron ore, copper, over the next few years because inventory levels are so high right now. To summarize, the combination of factors then, rising supply, dropping demand, and a lot of inventory to work off, all but guarantee the price of hard commodities are going to fall possibly quite hard. What does this all mean? It means most of the emerging world is, uh, most of the emerging world is, is comprised of commodity exporters. So these countries will not be getting the free ride they got past decade. India and China, of course, are net commodity importers, but we know their growth is already slowing. So I think this decade's emerging market investment climate, more than anything else, will be driven by structural reforms those who do it and those who don't do it. <laughs>